We will now approach our Lord in prayer. In our prayer this afternoon, we will remember Jolene Locke of Johan and Pauline uh, of Rivers. Jolene fell this morning and hit her head and had to be taken to the hospital by ambulance. So let us pray and remember that as well in our prayer. Our gracious and heavenly God, almighty Father, it is so good to gather, to join together this afternoon in worship as we may continue to rest on this day and be blessed with the worship of the saints as we gather before your holy presence. It is good to join together with your church as it is gathered in various places all over your dominion today. We could be reminded of that this morning when we heard letters of greeting and thanksgiving read to us as your children gathered in places in this region of our country rejoiced with us. Lord, we, we know that your people are gathering together and are joining together via live stream to, to worship you, and we pray that you will continue to bless with your Holy Spirit and Word this gathering work of Jesus Christ. It is also good to be joined together in heart and spirit and prayer with our brothers and sisters of the Rivers Congregation as well. We know, Lord, that also they on this day were rejoicing with us and that they too will be able to experience the blessing of your gift in this morning's installation. Lord, it's good to know that you are a God who cares for and provides for your people. And so at this time too, we remember Jolene. Lord, will you watch over her in this hour? Will you comfort and encourage her parents? We pray that you will grant her full health and restoration, and Lord, grant her the care she needs. We pray that, Lord, you will restore her completely. Oh God, it is good to know that you are a God of rich promises, a God who grants wonderful privileges in the covenant of grace. And we pray this afternoon that you will help us to believe and to accept and to trust those promises, also as they will be elaborated on and explained this afternoon through the ministry of your word. We pray, Father, that you will give us all the illumination and enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. Give it to me as I bring the message of your word for the first time to this congregation. And also, Lord, give it to the members of this congregation, both here and via the live stream, as they are worshiping and listening along. Oh, Lord, will you be with us all? Will you work powerfully in us and truly comfort us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This afternoon we will turn to God's holy word. We will listen to the ministry of the word as based from Isaiah 40, the verses 1 through 5. And so with that in mind, we will read together from that passage beginning at verse 1, Isaiah 40, verse 1. We'll read to verse 11. And then after that, we'll turn to the New Testament and read from 2 Corinthians 1. So we begin reading from Isaiah 40, verse 1. This is God's Word. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, 
In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and His arm rules for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him and His recompense before Him. He will tend His flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in His arms. He will carry them in His bosom and gently lead those that are with young. So that's Isaiah 40. Let's now turn to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians chapter 1, where we will read also the verses 1 through 11. 2 Corinthians 1, beginning at verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us. On Him we have set our hope that He will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So far, the reading of God's holy word. So as I mentioned earlier, this afternoon's text is taken from Isaiah chapter 40, and we will be focusing this afternoon on the verses 1 through 5. This afternoon's text makes reference to the lifting up of valleys, of making low the mountains and hills, and the becoming level of uneven ground, and the making of, making of a plain of what was once rough ground. And when you reflect on that, brothers and sisters, as I reflected on that, I felt it sort of typified the very journey that my family just undertook as we, as we came from the, the uneven, mountainous land of Smithers to the flat prairie town of Carmen. We went from the tall, impressive mountains of B.C. to the the flat, level prairies of Manitoba. Now, back in B.C., uh, when I had accepted the call here, many said, 
that they couldn't understand what would lead someone to leave the beautiful mountains of B.C. to live in Manitoba. Well, they thought the only possible reason that could be was because I would be moving closer to my family. Well, that's true, of course. What they did not understand was the pure beauty and the blessing of the prairies. And brothers and sisters, in our text this afternoon, which we will read in a moment, there is actually, in fact, a clear indication that the mountains, the hills, are depicted as obstacles. That is to say, they're portrayed in a negative light. Yes, the mountains are beautiful, but have you ever tried to climb one? Have you ever tried to pull your trailer through one of the passes? The Bible here in our text is presenting flat and level ground as something very positive. It's presenting the possibility of transition, of transformation, of blessing. And that God is instructing His servant Isaiah to lead His people and prepare His people in that sort of direction, I find personally meaningful as I am installed here as your pastor and teacher, going from the rugged mountains to the level plains. I find it instructive for me as I begin my ministry here, and I truly desire, I want that you would share those same observations this afternoon. My prayer is that you consider the truths presented by our Lord here, and that you will also follow Isaiah's instruction and commit this afternoon to come alongside me and to follow my lead along the plain and level ground on the way to forgiveness and redemption and the life everlasting. Let's read together our text one more time. Isaiah 40, the verses 1 through 5. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This afternoon I preach to you God's holy word under this theme. God calls His servant to proclaim abounding comfort to His afflicted people. That's how we summarize the message this afternoon. God calls His servant to proclaim abounding comfort to His afflicted people. And that means to proclaim that they are God's people, that they have been forgiven, and that God will bring them home. So first we will consider that God's servant is called to proclaim that they are God's people. Isaiah was a prophet of the 8th century B.C. A prophet of the two southern tribes of Judah. Not only that, Isaiah has personally witnessed the destruction of the ten northern tribes of Israel. He saw the affliction that happened around 722 B.C. when God unleashed His judgment on the ten tribes of, of Israel through the rod of Assyria. Israel had become unfaithful 
had been worshiping in Samaria instead of Jerusalem, and as they had taken their worship away from the place of worship that God had instituted, that is in Jerusalem, so also their allegiance to that one and only God diminished, and in some cases entirely disappeared. As prophet of the Lord to the two southern tribes, Isaiah's task was to warn these two tribes of Judah of a similar consequence if they did not repent. And he was called to present the ten northern tribes as an example of what will happen to Judah if they did not change their ways. Worse, Isaiah also was called to predict Judah's downfall because they would not repent. And thus we read in chapter 39 of his prophecy, Isaiah's words to Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, when he says, beginning in verse 6, Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. What Isaiah prophesies around 700 B.C. is not actually fulfilled until over 100 years later, in the year 586 and around there, when the two southern tribes of Judah fell to Nebuchadnezzar, king of, Judah, uh, king of Babylon. And we read in chapter 39 and previous that Hezekiah's permission to have the envoys from Babylon view all of the king's palace is a symbol of Judah's deep fall into sin and rebellion. Hezekiah, by allowing the envoys to see everything, basically was making an alliance with Babylon. And that was all symptomatic of the lack of trust that the people of Judah would also show. Trust in God. And so eventually, Judah, like Israel, would be removed from the presence of the Lord. The Lord would no longer dwell with them. Well, you can imagine that such a message about that result of their sin would fill the people with darkness and with gloom. Unlike Hezekiah, whom you, whom you may remember or recall, the people would probably mourn for their children and their children's children. They would grieve the coming and then later the present affliction in Babylon. The people in exile would grieve in their suffering and struggle. Now I mention all this because all of this is implied in that word comfort that we find in our text. Comfort, comfort my people says your God. The people are sorrowing in distress. The message that Isaiah is called to bring to a people in distress is to be a message of encouragement because they are a downtrodden people. God's servant, Isaiah, must proclaim the God of grace who is a God of comfort that He still is their God who upholds His covenant forever and who is faithful to His promises despite the people's weaknesses and shortcomings and mistakes. He is a God who has chosen a people to save. Now that must be the approach and the attitude of every gospel minister even today. The minister must understand and know, and indeed he does, 
that the flock is not a perfect flock. That the flock experiences many sorrows and trials and tribulations. The minister of God knows that the members are sinners and that they struggle with sin and with temptation and with the flesh. Just as he does. Yes, your new minister is not perfect either. The fact is we're all in this together and therefore together with the use of our gifts, with the use of our prayers, we will turn to the Word of God for true comfort. I want you to notice how Isaiah is called to comfort my people and that He must refer to God as your God. God has indeed established an intimate relationship of love with His chosen people. And His love never fails, despite the people's sins, despite her unfaithfulness and spiritual adultery from time to time. God will always be a faithful husband to His bride. His grace is amazing, considering the affliction and distress the people have placed themselves in due to their sin and rebellion. What a wonderful thing it is to hear from Sunday to Sunday that God is your God and that you are His people. How comforting it is to be reminded of the faithfulness and goodness of God. Also notice that God commands Isaiah to comfort, comfort my people. We read comfort twice. And that repetition of that word comfort is God's measured response to the judgment that He has declared against sinners It has this special effect that God is promising abundant comfort or abounding comfort. He is a God, as Paul puts it, of all comfort. Isaiah's task as God's servant is to preach the gospel and his promises and point to God as their only hope. That's how Paul also put it in our reading as we noted that in 2 Corinthians 1, that He is, He says in verse 7, our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. And He speaks of that hope further as well, that our hope is in God. Isaiah's task is, as God's servant, is to indeed comfort the people with the hope that we have in God. And so he sets out in the rest of this chapter, indeed in the rest of his book, to show the the greatness of God and to contrast that with the feebleness of man and with the weakness of our idols. It's striking, brothers and sisters, that this prophecy is given over 100 years before the Babylonian captivity. This shows that God is a good God who knows how much His people need to be prepared. Some of us may think that we have everything together. And indeed, there may be times in our lives where our faith is strong and and active. And then we tend to think we don't need God's warnings as much as we think others do. But by giving this message to God's people so far in advance, shows that God knows that anyone can fall into distress and tribulation, into sickness and temptation, that they can fall into sin at any time and and their faith will be put to the test. 
Anyone can become complacent or apathetic or swayed by this world. And such preaching then serves to prepare God's people for those times. It serves to warn the people to repent in those times. God also knows, as the pastor and minister should know, that any given number of people will be at any given time experiencing true distress and affliction or tragedy or grief right now. There are people who are hurting, who have been abused, and and those people need God's servant today to comfort and encourage with the gospel so that they put their hope and trust in God and look forward to the future times of refreshment. Ultimately, God's servant, reminding that they are God's people, must proclaim that their sins are forgiven. And that's our second point. God's servant is called to proclaim that God's afflicted people have been forgiven. Isaiah's message is that God has not, He never has abandoned His people. Even in His wrath, even in His discipline, He does not abandon them. The covenant He made with their forefathers still stands. The ancient promises are not forgotten. The Lord is not indifferent to Jerusalem's plight in spite of all the disasters which have fallen upon her. And as such, He still has plans for His people. Just like the parable of the prodigal son, God wants His people to know that after all their sin, they still have a loving Father to return to. God will speak to His beloved nation words of grace through His prophet, words of consolation and comfort. That's why we read in our text that He must speak tenderly to them. Judah's plight, you must understand, is not merely a physical plight. The exile into Babylon is not merely a physical exile. It's not just earthly but it is also and especially is spiritual. In verse 2, when it says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem, that is, speak tenderly to God's people, then in the original it says there, speak to the heart. And so you see, it's not a physical thing, first of all. God wants to address the deepest needs of His people. He wants his servant to to speak to the tragedy and the suffering and the grief associated with the broken human condition as a result of the depravity of the fall and of continuing sin. The servant of God is to speak to the restoration and reconciliation of the soul and body. And that's how we need to understand also the expression that her warfare is ended. Yes, it is true that eventually, after 70 years, hostile Babylon will be defeated and they will be punished and the people will go free and they will be able to return to Judah and Jerusalem. But more importantly, the hostility and the warfare that is raging within the heart will be ended. God is going to bring true and lasting peace and restitution to the soul of the believer. Thus Isaiah must bring the message that the penalty for sins has been paid for in full. They have, he used to say, received double for all their sins. We've already been introduced to the concept of double, double comfort, which speaks to abundant or abounding comfort. Well, here we read about receiving double for all her sins. That means 
All their sins will be paid for in full. There will be complete redemption. They will be fully released from all their hard labor. They will be granted a royal pardon. And the prison doors will swing open. And they will be truly free without any debt. Now one might ask, how does that happen? How does that come about? How is it possible? Does 50 or 60 or 70 years of hard labor, is that sufficient payment for all the rebelliousness against God? Is that what is meant that they have received double for all their sins? No, beloved. We have mysterious words here. A mystery that is not explained further until Isaiah 53, when God will make known the truth of the suffering servant, the servant that has received a double wrath of God so that there is double redemption, the fullness of redemption. A suffering servant, we read in Isaiah 53, who was pierced for our transgressions, and who was crushed for our iniquities, and by whose wounds we are healed. What I mean is, this prophecy is pointing to Christ, to Jesus Christ. He, He is the basis for Judah's and our comfort. It is He who has made the full and complete satisfaction for all our sins. He has rendered the perfect sacrifice on the cross so that the justice and mercy of God might be fulfilled and completed. Justice, because our sins are fully paid for. And mercy, because He can deliver us from our sin and guide us by the Spirit into a new and everlasting life. The message the servant of the Lord is to bring to God's people is that you are forgiven. That's true for the people of Isaiah's day, for the captives of Babylon later, and for the people of the New Testament age, and for you and for me. Our sin has been paid for. Our hard labor is over. Beloved, what more comforting truth could there be for a shattered people than that? What better than being delivered from an earthly suffering and bondage than to be delivered from our spiritual bondage? What it means is that God can once again dwell with us and we, His people, can dwell with Him. That is, we can be home with our Heavenly Father. And that's our third point. God's servant must proclaim that God will lead His afflicted people home. In verses 3 to 5, there is further elaboration of the calling and message that God wants His servant to bring. It says there, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Now, a typical way of understanding these words in verses 3 to 5 is that after 70 years of captivity in Babylon, God is going to lead His people out of exile and bring them back to Judah and the land of promise. That is to say, the very difficult path from Babylon back to Judah and Jerusalem, the the hilly and mountainous and arduous and and tough land fraught with dangers is going to to be, a highway is going to be placed in that land so that the people can go back and the path will be made smooth for them to Jerusalem. But let us notice here in our text that God is not saying that Isaiah must announce the preparation of a way for the people by God so that the people can cross over from Babylon into Israel again. But rather, we read here in our text the call of the prophet that the people prepare a way for God. In the wilderness, prepare the way 
of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a way, a highway for our God. What does this mean? Well, let us, as we contemplate this, these last words, let us realize that these words of verses 3 to 5 have been applied in the Gospels, and you can see that if you turn to the Gospels, in every beginning of each Gospel, when, when it is announced that John the Baptist came, that these words are applied to him. It's not that there wasn't a previous fulfillment of these verses in Isaiah, that it's specifically applied to John. For there is, of course, previous fulfillments. But the truth is that in John, we have the fulfillment of this prophecy all the more. And especially in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth. Now in Israel, so not between Babylon and Israel, but in Israel itself, there were many roads and pathways that were littered with obstacles and dangers. And when an important person would come to a town, for example, the king, then they would send a messenger ahead of that king to make sure that the king could arrive safely to that town that he could arrive smoothly so that his message could be received, so that his blessing could be received. And those people in that town, the messenger would run to that town ahead of the king and call them, cry out to them to make the roads ready for the king's arrival, to to work to get those roads in tip-top shape and to fill all the holes and and to remove any dangerous rocks or roots and, and to make sure the snakes had all been beaten back. Isaiah, as a forerunner, but especially John, as a forerunner, came to announce the impending rival of the Savior, the great King of heaven and earth, and the people were called to make themselves ready, to make the road ready for the Christ to come. And then you will understand, as we have been seeing what has been the theme and the thread of this text already, we are not talking here literally, but spiritually. John was to call the people to prepare their hearts for the coming King. And so we note in those four Gospels that every time it is mentioned that John fulfills the role of these verses in our text, that he ministers to them and calls out to them, that it says there he called them to repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words... The call to Isaiah, the call to John, the call to every gospel minister is that when you are called to comfort God's people, that means not only to call them to faith and trust in in a gracious God, but it's also the call to repentance. True gospel ministry is the call to faith and repentance, as our confession puts it. And that is what verses 3 to 5 are really saying in our text. That's what it means to prepare the way of the Lord. That is the way to true, double, full and abounding and abundant comfort. That if you repent, if you make your hearts ready to receive the message, then the wilderness and the captivity in which we find ourselves through sin will become a level ground for which God in Jesus Christ to come to us and enter us forever. When the people make their hearts ready to receive the gospel, that means they are humbling themselves. They are repenting of their sins. And that's 
when the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Indeed, all flesh shall see it together. That is not just the people themselves as they witness the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and, and the change that happens in their lives, but their neighbors will see the difference too. And so, yes, beloved, as we Result, God will not leave them where they are either, but by His grace and, and by the power of the Spirit working in His people, He will also then bring them home. The processional way through the wilderness is not then not just for the Lord to come to us, but it's a way for His people to, so that He can take them to Himself to be with Him, so that He can tend them and gather them in his arms and, and carry them as the shepherd carries the lambs and lead them as he brings them to Zion, to the dwelling place of the Lord. And so you know what this means? This means for the people of Judah, just to leave Babylon and return to Judah physically after 70 years is not enough. A physical departure from Babylon and a physical presence in Judah and Jerusalem is not enough to live forever with God. It's not enough to just go along for the ride. But there has to be the all and more important transition and transformation of the heart from death to life. There must be faith and repentance. It means that being a member of the church or, or faithfully attending church twice every Sunday or even being busy in a committee does not save us. We must work with the promises. We must heed the call to faith and to repentance. We must work with the preaching. We must work with the promises and the warnings of Scripture and ensure that our hearts are good soil to receive the gospel, the seed of regeneration, to be truly and abundantly comforted. And so we may conclude this afternoon. As you receive me as your new pastor and teacher today, let us not just acknowledge that as God's messenger, I have literally taken a path of going from the mountains and hills to the prairies and level ground. Rather, this only serves to be a picture of something greater and deeper, something more of the heart. It serves as a picture of what we all need to do spiritually and make a way for the Lord. Let's realize, beloved, that all of us, including myself, need to constantly be preparing our hearts and removing any obstacles that would prevent God in Jesus Christ through His preached Word and Spirit from entering and giving us abundant comfort. Amen.